Excellent. Well, good morning. I'll call this meeting to order. Um, welcome to the January Board of Regents meeting. Chair Dombrowski is unable to join us today. So as the role of vice chair, please to step in and see if I can help lead this agenda for the first meeting of 2024. Thanks to uh, each of you for making the trip and for uh, Regent Bow and Regent Southworth joining us remotely. Uh, we miss you, but we're glad you're here with us as well. Um, with that, Leanne, would you mm -hmm. please lead us through roll call? Uh, Chair Buchanan. Here. Chair Dombrowski. She's out. Excuse, Excuse me. Yeah. Regent Rogers. Here. Regent Lozar. Here. Regent Bow. Here. Just online. Regent Southworth. Online. Here. 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 Helen Patmire on behalf of Governor Jane Forte. Here. Uh, Superintendent Arneson. I saw her this morning. She'll be here soon, I'm sure. Regent Yeager. Here. There is a quorum, Mr. Chair. Ready for this. Appreciate it, Leanne. Thank you so much. And again, um, welcome to everybody to the first meeting of 2024. <clears throat> Big thank you to everyone here present, as well as those tuning in online for the deep and apparent commitment that we make to the students of the state of Montana. Um, just came from breakfast with legislative leadership and I think it is important to point out that as they're wrestling with some issues at the state workforce development is a key issue and uh, I think it's important Commissioner Christian as you walked out to prepare for here they did single you out in your efforts from uh, your staff here at Ochi at uh, taking a very innovative approach towards how we help and, and push the dial on that so thank you to you and your crew really appreciate you um, the January meetings, as we know, are a little truncated. I'm excited about a couple of items on that. Nonetheless, every item on this agenda is worth consideration. And again, want to thank you for being here. Uh, before we jump into the agenda, I think it's important to make a couple of comments. First, congratulations to the nearly 2,000 degrees that were conferred across the system to our students in December. Um, not only to the students and their families for persevering and completing that, but to the faculty, staff, and uh, members of each campus communities that help those students succeed. Um, that is an awesome, awesome time of year and time of life for these young people to, to close that gap and, and demonstrate their ability to succeed and, and move on to the next chapter of their lives. Uh, <clears throat> our hope, of course, is that what we've been able to instill on them prepares them for that next step. Um, as we think about the agenda today, uh, I think it's really appropriate. I want to thank Deputy Commissioner Teal and Commissioner uh, Christian for elevating the subject of artificial intelligence, AI. Um, we're hearing about it everywhere. Um, and I think it's it's already been a conversation that we understand. Well, I could say I understand the thin piece of it, but we understand we need to get our arms around, um, whether it's identifying it, regulating it, leveraging it, utilizing it, um, it's here. And we wanna be at the front, front edge of how we incorporate what we do, how we handle it. And I'm excited about that presentation, Mr. Commissioner. Thanks so much for doing that. We'll also be considering a couple of staff items to emeriti faculty, a parking improvement proposal, uh, our consent agenda, which is hefty this month, thank you, uh, includes requests for authorizations of seven foundation operating agreements between campuses and foundations, uh, a recurring duty that we buy and we review. Um, so again, <clears throat> before I turn it over to Commissioner Christian, just a thank you to you and your staff for uh, the preparation and the work uh, that you put together in bringing today's, today's agenda to us. And before I do turn it over to Commissioner Christian, um, everybody has received a copy of the minutes. Um, if there are any corrections to be, if there are no additional corrections to be considered at this stage, uh, we'll consider those adopted. Are there any corrections or comments from members of the board related to the minutes? Seeing none, um, those are adopted. Great, Commissioner Christian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, appreciate everyone being here on a nice brisk Hell in the morning, although it sounds like this weather uh, extends uh, all across uh, the great state and maybe across the, the, the region. So I uh, appreciate everybody getting out and being here. I, Chair Buchanan would echo your congratulations to our newly minted graduates. Um, commencement's just such a good time to reflect on how fortunate we are in the MUS to employ exceptional faculty and staff who walk with these students every step of the way helping them realize those goals. And I, you know, I, the Montana system just would not be what it is uh, and, and the destination that it is for so many students without the commitment demonstrated by 
all of those individuals. So commencement uh, brings excitement, but it certainly brings our gratitude to all the people that work day in and day out. It is, after all, what we're all about, and uh, recognizing that is important. Um, just a few brief things. I want to kick off the report today, though, with uh, the announcement of hiring Ochi's new Deputy Commissioner for Government Relations and Communications, Galen Hollenbach. Galen uh, comes to Ochi on the heels of a very distinguished career in government, having held senior positions and policy positions at uh, Department of Labor, Department of Justice, Office of Secretary of State. Also served four terms in the House of Representatives and has a very keen grasp on legislative policy, budget process, was on appropriations. Uh, and I, I, I just think this will serve the system incredibly well. Uh, on the legislative front, government-related front, um, with interim work and, and beyond. Uh, it'll be a busy position. As they say, the uh, government never sleeps, and now Galen, uh, fresh out of retirement, won't sleep either. Uh, fortunately for the MUS, though, is not, not only does he come with an incredible professional background, but he also has a, a personal history and, and passion for uh, post-secondary education and its ability to transform lives. And so Galen, welcome. Welcome to the team. Glad you're here. Um, one other sort of a, a announcement on that front, moving on to the Tech Hub, something we've talked quite a bit about, but also very pleased to announce that Tim Van Rankin has joined to serve as our Regional Innovation Officer, or RIO, uh, to help guide and coordinate the Tech Hub's efforts uh, moving forward and, and through our submission and uh, funding application that is due at the end of February. Hopefully it'll take a little pressure off your deputy commissioner, Mr. Teal too, who's been running both lives for a while, but uh, appreciate Joe's leadership on that task force and, and welcome Tim to, uh, to the process. He's got uh, great experience uh, working with Montana Science and Technology, first as uh, the NSF EPSCoR Research Program uh, Director and, and more recently now with Technology and Transportation mm -hmm. Policy Advisor for Senator Tester. So we're Grateful that Tim is making the leap from the gov federal government coming back to Montana and will bring a lot of uh, know-how and innovation to the Tech Hub. So welcome to Tim. Um, you know, as we discuss uh, at the November meeting, this Tech Hub designation wouldn't have been possible without uh, just incredible support from dozens of individuals, businesses, organizations throughout the state. Among those certainly has been the Chamber. They've helped lead these conversations and be part of this and uh, thank them for their event this week, Business Days at the Capitol, which is several of us were able to attend last night, today, and a number of staff and uh, campus leaders are attending most of their their uh, event here this week. So I want to thank them for their partnership throughout the, the Tech Hub and, and what we do in higher education. Glad they recognize uh, this morning, too, sort of the value proposition that we can bring to that conversation. Uh, final sort of note on my list here, uh, although maybe most important amongst it, I, I want to call out Wichi uh, Forum has selected the Montana University System and Montana 10's Student Success Initi Initiative, spearheaded by uh, our own Christine Miller as the winner of the 2024 Wichi Forum Colleague Choice Innovation Awards. Awesome. Um, so super proud of that. As you know, Montana 10, uh, has done a lot and it'll be recognized at the forum's annual meeting in April. Uh, in addition, Montana 10 will be highlighted in Wichi's press release and featured on the organization's website. And they've also invited uh, Christine to participate in a, a webinar panel uh, this summer that'll help other institutions realize the gains that we've made around Montana 10. Um, since its inception as a pilot, uh, it's really demonstrated proven measurable outcomes for students in their programs, including students staying in school and graduating uh, sooner, progressing to on time or early degree completion, and changing their behaviors around career planning, planning, financial aid, and tutoring, mentoring, and even mental health. So we're really proud of uh, what's happening there, the success story, and, and uh, really uh, in no small part is attributable to Christine's efforts leading this, and, and we're just thrilled to be nationally recognized as an innovative leader uh, with Montana 10. I suppose a, a small shout out goes to the late Brock Tessman, 
<laughs> no doubt he'd be having a nice <laughs> late. Yeah, yeah, I like to think <laughs> of him as a late. Me over that. <laughs> he's got, I assume he's having a nice brisk morning on the uh, Upper Peninsula himself. So uh, thanks for his uh, leadership along the way. Um, Mr. Chair, I think we may have one introduction. Do we have anybody from Northern on or the, we, we had a. Jennifer Brown. Um, is on. I don't know if she's prepared to do the introduction. Uh, Chancellor Kegel is not on. Line. Fair enough. We'll, we'll, we can do it at a later time. Um, with that, then uh, chair Buchanan members of the board. I, I, I think you'll find this next presentation. We have really dedicated a lot of this morning to this work around artificial uh, intelligence and, uh, you know, it's, it's effect on post-secondary education. We think it's uh, incredibly important. We'll be a part of life moving forward. And I, I think we, we need to spend some time sort of figuring out how that integrates with the work that we're doing with, with academia, with, with all walks of life. And so we put together, uh, what I hope will be an illuminating and thought provoking, uh, discussion for this morning and uh, help us all to sort of gain an understanding of what it is and how it will intersect with uh, post-secondary education. I'm going to hand it over to Joe, but I would also say Joe is, is helping to, to spearhead a larger group that will be taking a much deeper dive on this topic, um, which I, I just think is incredibly important and help us decide where we go from here, what, what that needs in the long run. Is it board guidance, board policy, board what to help sort of set the stage and then ultimately uh, give the campuses uh, well-deserved sort of academic um, purview in, in this conversation as well, but uh, help us get started moving. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Teal and we can kick this thing off. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I'll, I'll be brief. I, I think uh, Commissioner Christian was exactly right. This is a huge title shift. I think when Chat GPT launched on the scene last year, mm -hmm. we immediately thought about kind of the small questions, you know, uh, what does this mean for plagiarism? What does this mean for a lot of these academic policies? And I think there's been a lot of work thinking through those pieces. That's important. Uh, but I think we're quickly realizing this is moving incredibly fast. It's disrupting all industries, including ours. And there's much larger risks and opportunities that we need to come to grips with in one way or another. Um, you know, this is changing what our students are going to need to know to be effective in their roles and in the workforce so quickly. That also means it's a big challenge for our faculty and staff to understand how do I incorporate this in my coursework, in my curriculum? How do I keep up to date with how this is changing how life works in the industry that I'm trying to teach and help students to enter into successfully. And then what does it mean for our campuses and our campuses operations that should also be thinking for the risks and the opportunities to use these tools to be more efficient, to better serve students. And so there is, I think, some good work going on. We have a task force that had its first meeting before the new year is going to meet again soon and have more in-depth workshop. There's great work going on at Many of our institutions, sometimes across our institutions at University of Montana, hosting an AI symposium next week. Uh, the Montana State University Center for Faculty Excellence doing some substantial work in this area. I think our goal with that task force is how do we help each other kind of raise our gazes from the small and the pedestrian to the big opportunities on the horizon? How do we structure some ideas of how to do that effectively in such a quickly changing environment? And then where are there some recommendations for you as a board on, in terms of policies, investments that might be necessary because of those changes? Just wanna highlight one other piece that I think is important, is exciting, you should be proud of, uh, and that's our MUS Teaching Scholars Program. This has happened since 2019. It's meant to recognize kind of faculty who are pushing the envelope on teaching and learning and doing excellent things in the classroom. We've recognized 40 folks, 40 folks over those years uh, who have led communities on their campuses around kind of the topical issues in teaching and learning of the day. We're now recruiting a new class to be recognized and their focus is gonna be on artificial intelligence in the classroom. 
how, how it should be incorporated in different disciplines, how we as institutions, as teachers, as learners should be reacting. So uh, that will be launched today and we expect those uh, teams of excellent teachers will be working over the coming year. On the note of kind of raising our gaze, we wanted to kick this off by, by bringing in some helpful outside expertise and perspectives to, to give the board or campuses some sense of how AI is already disrupting higher education, what we might anticipate it doing in the near future in terms of disrupting higher education, some of the impacts, that risks, opportunities that we should be reacting to. And very grateful to have Dave and Helen Edwards uh, join us today. Dave and Helen run a firm called Artificiality and have uh, supported Fortune 100 companies in trying to develop their strategies around reacting to AI. Uh, Dave has worked at Morgan Stanley, Apple in te technology advising spaces, Helen uh, in the energy sector. Helen has also served as a commissioner on Oregon's Higher Education Coordinating Commission, has helped and I know been a big supporter and driver of some of their efforts in exactly this space. So excited to hand it over to Dave and Helen to provide a presentation, some context of discussion around AI and post-secondary education. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to the commissioner and deputy commissioner for having us here. We're excited to be here talking to you about AI. Um, uh, we founded Artificiality in 2019 to help people make sense of artificial intelligence. Um, just as background, we publish articles, podcasts, and research with a human uh, view of the human impact of AI. Um, we do heavy research through our Artificiality Pro um, work, and we will be referencing some of that work today. So we'd like to talk to you a little bit today about AI in general, uh, generative AI specifically, and what's really captured the imagination of, the, of uh, society broadly. We'll talk about AI in education uh, and dig into some of the core challenges uh, and opportunities for education broadly with AI. So we'll start, um, go ahead and you can uh, click on to the next slide. We'd like to start by asking you all just to reflect a moment on when you think about AI, when you think about chat GPT, um, what is your excitement to fear ratio? You could think about it as a mathematical equation. It could be 50-50, or it could be nine to, ten, nine to one, or some sort of ratio, but think about that just for a moment and reflect on where you sit on both sides of this question, excitement and fear. Great, thank you. Just hold that, we will come back to you that question towards the end. So if you could click the next slide. We're gonna walk through several topics today. Um, we're gonna to talk about um, framing AI and history of technology and what we call the intimacy economy. We'll talk about generative AI, the good and the bad. We'll discuss AI in terms of uh, enhancing learning or the potential for enhancing learning. We'll put AI in a frame of what we call the world of workflows and how we think about using AI and how you can think strategically about implementing AI. We'll talk about AI inside and how we're seeing a shift of how the technology will come to us as users. And finally, we'll close with a little uh, thought process about knowledge and how we think about the different potentials for how AI could work. Next slide. So over the course of technology, we're starting here in 1995, which is clearly not the beginning of technology, but it's where it's sort of the dawn of the commercial internet. And as we connected computers around the world, we allowed everyone to access information everywhere. And it became called the information economy. And it's because we were trading on information. We'd go and click on something, we'd see an ad someone had paid for, and that was what's funded and, and developed the industry. And that's why we used the internet. Around 2010 or so, these are rounded numbers, we began what became sort of the social and mobile era. They, they both came together at once. Social allowed the world to progress from not just viewing content created by aggregators and key companies and publishers, but seeing content created by absolutely anyone. And so it became a two-way world of attention. We were, being, we were being monetized for our attention. If you watch YouTube, the algorithm is designed to keep you watching whatever the next video is for as long as possible, present more ads. We also offered up information because we wanted to be paid attention to. And this attention economy became addictive because it was in our pockets as well on our phones. We're now starting a new world 
as generative AI really progresses, and we think of it as the intimate intimacy economy. But what we mean by intimacy is that these machines are developing an intimate knowledge about us as we converse with them, as they remember more and more of our conversations, they're learning more about us than perhaps any person around us. There are definitely technologies that you can use, generative AI tools today, that you might say something to that you wouldn't say to someone you're very close with. So these tools are developing quite an intimate knowledge of us. The last little bubble in the top right we have is artificial general intelligence. This is a grand debate in the industry of whether AI will become artificially generally intelligent, which, gen which means that it, the, the idea is that it can do anything a human can do. I'll, I'll preface and caution you that there's lots of different definitions of AGI, but the key question is, and the reason we bring it up, is that the companies that are most in front of this industry, their goal is to create AGI. Their stated goal is to create technology that will be able to surpass human cognition on anything. Now, as we progress with here, we have some fundamental questions. One is, what happens to our knowledge and learning as we outsource more of our cognition to AI? What happens as we begin to outsource more of imagination, intuition, synthesis, analysis, even metacognition to a machine? The second is, why is this so different, right? And how are we gonna pay for it all? So click to the next slide, please. A key question of why it's so different. You rewind back to the 1960s and Marshall McLuhan who coined the phrase, the medium is the message. And he wrote that to basically reflect on the fact that with each new technology that transmits content, the message became dominated by what that medium is. So we went from long form content in books to short form in telegrams to audio only and radio to entertainment on TV. And his ideas extended into the internet and, mo and social worlds. Our content is definitely modified by the medium it's sent through. This new world of generative AI though is fundamentally different because it is the first time that the medium is creating the message itself. Prior to this, all technology was communicating what we as humans create and passing that on, but this is now fundamentally different. Next slide, please. When we think about monetizing this intimacy economy, a key question is who are the companies that are creating this? And we have a set here of what we sort of call the AI Goliaths. They're the big companies. And the reason why they're all so big is that AI is very expensive to build. A lot of the conversation is about how much it costs to train these models. It can be hundreds of millions of dollars for the largest, company, uh, largest models, but to deliver that content to each individual will cost significantly more than the training. What's called inference, when you prompt it and you get a response, is very expensive computationally. So every company that's involved here has a vast amount of money behind them. So why are they doing this? Well, if you look at each of these, you just kind of put what their fundamental reason for being is. Google, it's about information, plus their cloud business, obviously. Microsoft, productivity. Amazon, retail, find, Facebook connections, Apple experiences. This is their, how they're thinking about bringing generative AI into their systems. Uh, and the final one there is a logo you may not recognize yet. It's OpenAI. And although they're quite small in comparison to the other big companies here, they're really, really important. This is the company that created ChatGPT. It is the company with the most out, the most forefront goal of creating AGI. It's also the company that last year made a lot of news because there was a lot of craziness going on in their executive suite. So it's a it is an important company to really recognize. Now the question here is as we move to an intimacy economy and as we move to generative AI and different kinds of experiences with technology, how will all of this be financed? So far, we don't see ads that has funded the entire growth of the internet and, the, and social worlds. We probably, we may not even, because having an ad and content that's created for you kinds of degrades the value of it. So how will these companies make money? Today, so far it's subscriptions, but this obviously creates a digital divide question, which is across society and is quite fundamental to education. Next slide. Now, some of this does have some, some true upside for everyone is that the major companies, one of the key things they've done is created what's called foundation models. So this big stack of technology, the key thing to look at is the big red box. So that's where we call the foundation models. You sit on top of cloud platforms that sit on top of chips 
These are big models that these large companies have made that you can access through APIs. That means that anyone in the world can build something like ChatGPT because they can plug into the API from OpenAI. And that's not just them. There's all kinds of large companies, small companies, and many, many open source projects, which are very intriguing to us, that allow people to make and access, make applications by accessing these large models. That's very different from pretty much any other thing that we've done. Because prior to all of this era that last year, everything was a full stack. You had to have the compute, you had to have the data, you had to have the people, you had to have everything to be able to make AI. Now you're starting to see really simple ways of accessing this very, very powerful technology. Next slide, please. We'd like to move on to the sort of digging into generative AI, what it is and what we view as the good and the bad. So let's start with the good. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. So the, it, the key premise for generative AI is that it can access any data everywhere in the world, an entire data cosmos. Right? These, these models are trained on trillions of parameters and they were able to bring it all together into a novel creation that is just for you. Every time you actually get, you get something from these tools, it's something that is unique. And that is very, very powerful. Next slide. So if you look at ChatGPT or any of those other tools, you'll notice that this grand explosion happens when you touch it. Traditional AI, basically anything prior to generative AI, the goal was to be able to have a specific prediction. You were asking for sales next quarter. You were asking for the best link that you might want out of Google search. The whole idea was hitting a bullseye of what you might be looking for. Generative AI, though, is quite different. It's a huge explosion of ideas. It's trying to be creative and generative, and that's really powerful. Next slide. But that does create a, a confusion in the overall market. As people see this opportunity to be able to access an immense amount of data, but it isn't a replacement for Google, at least not yet. There's a lot of conversation about whether you can use these things as search tools, but you have to remember that what you're getting is the tools message, right? That it's aggregating through all of this data. It's not giving you access to specific content generated by other people. Next slide, please. Now, how these work is that they are guessing machines. And then we mean that intentionally. It is, it is guessing at what that next word is. So just like in this image where the next panel of the painting is building off of the last one, that's what's happening when you're getting a message back in text. That's what's happening when you're getting back in, in images. It is essentially guessing at that next thing. It's very powerful, but you remember that it is guessing. It doesn't know. It doesn't have an, a, a huge category, a huge you know uh, store of facts that it's drawing from. It's guessing at what the next possible word or image might be. Next slide. So if you went to ChatGPT, this is the interface, and you put in the same prompt in both in one right after the other, you would get completely unique and different descriptions. This is quite powerful when you want to get lots of different answers for something, but it does mean that everything is different. And you have to add, remember, remember to ask that fundamental question of whether what you're getting is essentially what you want, or if the next time you prompt it will be what you'd like. Next slide. It's not just about text. Generative AI extends to images, to audio, to video. You can see here are some images that were taken out of DALI, which is the image uh, generation program for also from OpenAI. And you can see on the right side how there's so many different ways to actually have what was asked for, which was a, a stern looking owl dressed as a librarian. And you could put it in all kinds of different forms. It can be in digital art. It could be referenced as a, as, as a particular artist like Andy Warhol. You could put it in a place in the bottom like it's in a Starbucks. It's fun. It's also really quite productive. But this kind of creative generation is what is possible. Next slide, please. Another key thing to remember is that these tools are fabricators. They're fabricating an answer based on what you've asked for it. Very powerful, but remember that sometimes it's asking, it's just giving an answer because you asked it. And because it's a guessing machine, sometimes those things aren't really accurate. So here's a few examples of fabrications. Next slide. And this is a dialogue going back and forth with ChatGPT. Can you think of a word that begins with M? That means emerging or developing or something like that and comes back with maturing. Hmm. 
Uh, how about anything that's, uh, you know, more juvenile, like less maturing? And then it says nascent. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but that begins with an N, not an M. It comes back with incipient. Okay, it's really not an M, right? It's just, it's generating sometimes nonsense. That's why a lot of people in the world call this hallucinations. But either way, being careful with this is important. Next slide. Here's a series of responses from different tools, ChatGPT, uh, Anthropics Claude, Microsoft Bing, Google Bard, all asking for the, a question, which is about a fact. When was the first mention of AI in the New York Times? And you can see lots of different answers. Although there, was, there is one authoritative answer, these all come up with different answers. Searching for facts is not a great use of these tools today. Next slide. As we approach an election year, we're all quite concerned about what might be fabricated. So here we have political enemies hugging, and I'm not sure how to describe Taylor Swift and Elon Musk hugging, but you can create these images really quite quickly and easily, and they're quite convincing. Some of these can be humorous like these, right? You can tell that these are likely jokes, but some of them could be quite um, problematic and sources of misinformation. Next slide. So as we think about generative value, you can remember that it cre create these incredible things, but you can't count on it to create anything accurate or truthful. Next slide. This leads into our one of our core research obsessions, which is on trust. Our premise here is that in order for AI to be useful, we need to know when and if to trust it. And so our work on re in research is to try and understand when we can actually be sure that we can trust a tool and when we know we can't. The stats here on the slide are from a research performed earlier last year that looked at several tools that are described as generative AI search tools. So they provide an answer and then they provide citations for those answer. And you would think that those citations would be just like a footnote that you'd find in a research paper or a student's report. But in reality, what they found is that just over half of the sentences in the, in the responses were fully supported with citations and just under three quarters of citations actually supported their associated sentence. That means that a quarter of the citations did not support the associated sentence. Now they're not telling you that, but that's a, that's a really honest and real and justified assumption because of the way it's presented. We've spent decades and decades of looking at written documents with citations. We should expect those citations to be accurate. But today, we can't trust those, those to be accurate in generative AI. Next slide. So let's talk about bias, because bias is definitely on the, we probably put it in the bad category for generative AI. One core starting point, though, is our world is biased and our data is biased because our data is created by us humans. And sometimes that bias can seem kind of innocuous. If you ask an AI what is more pleasant, it'll tell you that flowers are more pleasant than bees because that's our human experience. That's what we've written down in our data. That's what gets represented in AI because flowers look pretty and smell nice and bees, you're worried about getting stung. Sometimes bias is just our own human experience because we're the ones creating the data, but sometimes it becomes more challenging. Next slide. So in 2015, this is an image that came out of a BBC article that was looking at Google search results, specifically Google image results. And they found that when you searched for CEO, this was the string of images that you got. And it represents the record of the world that we've created through digital data. And you can see prominent CEOs like Jamie Dimon and Tim Cook and Steve Jobs. It takes you to the 28th image to find a woman in the bottom right-hand corner, which is actually not a real woman, but a doll. It was actually CEO Barbie. Now, this is the reflection of the data that exists on the internet. And so you could say, well, is that the right thing I'm looking for? Next slide. But clearly Google decided that it needed to do something different after this was exposed. And by 2024, this, uh, this is what you get when you look for CEO uh, as an image. And you see that they've manually adjusted the results to represent what they think is a more representative sample of images of different kinds of people, aspirational results like how to become a CEO. You're not sure exactly what you're looking for, but this removing bias often requires manual work. Next slide. 
Ignoring bias can leave quite a challenge and can leave users to find it. On the left are two strings, two images from Zoom. You can see on the top, two people talking in their actual rooms. Below that, the two people put on the, you know, the background images behind them, and one of them, their face was removed. We can't tell exactly why, but there is a history of image recognition um, technologies being uh, being much more uh, being having much more trouble recognizing darker skinned faces. On the right, you can see right in that middle, there's a picture of a woman named Brandy. This was her, this was the image, the headshot that she had on Twitter. She fed it into a tool called Lensa to make an artificial avatar from her. And that, that little bubble image that she has generated that those sets of images back from Lensa, likely showing the sort of preferences of the people that were rating the images in Lensa and what kind of images they wanted displayed. These things are problematic for sure because both of these people complained about it. They're also difficult because it took users to find it and expose it in a public setting for them to be found and be able to be corrected. This creates a very long-term challenge for anyone. As we generate images, it's nearly impossible to test every outcome. And the problem is when these outcomes are publicly disclosed in, and, and only caught in that way it can be a major um, sort of branding challenge. Next slide. Sometimes companies try to create guardrails and OpenAI has done that in ChatGPT. They pulled back on a lot of the challenging um, uh, and, and, and biased responses that came through text. Um, but then one researcher at Stanford found uh, that uh, if you ask um, uh, ChatGPT to write code for you, a Python program, an ASCII table, uh, you get uh, the, the really difficult and awful responses that you might expect where you can ask the tool to rate the value of a human brain based on, based on race. You can ask whether someone should be tortured based on country of origin. These things are buried in the data that it's learned. And what we're, it's a bit of a game of whack-a-mole for the companies to try to figure out how to prevent the models from providing these kinds of responses. Next slide. Sometimes bias is unpredictable and you're never sure where you're gonna find it. This is one that we stumbled across. We were looking for images and we asked for a barista smiling and images for a barista making a complicated drink. And you can see that this tool mid journey uh, predicts that smiling baristas are young women, uh, white, uh, and the baristas who make complicated drinks seem to be you know, burly men who work in Portland, Oregon. Uh, you know, it's with that sort of hipster vibe. Um, so it, these these are these are um, synthetic ideas. Um, these aren't actually factually accurate in terms of what who baristas are. But you can and you may not be able to predict it, but you can stumble across it. Next slide. Okay, so let's move on to some of the things to do with learning and education. Um, when, uh, we could say AI, we uh, we say our obsession is AI enhanced learning, but obviously there's a there's a big issue around whether or not AI um, how AI will will promote will actually enhance our learning or will it decrease it. If you go back to um, sort of this core idea that that <clears throat> thinking is shaped by explanations by desirable difficulty, by hard work, by writing, what happens if we start outsourcing that to an AI? Uh, what's the impact of not doing that hard work? Next slide, please. So we have an obsession around um, AI enhanced learning or learning with AI. And um, the premise is that integrating generative AI in learning and skill development is going to revolutionize the um, educational landscape. We've been hearing for years about how AI is going to change education. But the thing about generative AI and tools like ChatGPT and the tools we're going to see this year, which are um, you know, bringing a much more multimodal different kinds of things in the text and images and audio and what have you, is that uh, we have a different kind of outsourcing arrangement with this technology. It is a true cultural technology that allows us to um, learn in that cultural way that is so uh, definitive and, and, and um, defin definitional of being um, human and learning through our cultural um, mechanisms. And this is data from uh, Oregon. Uh, and none of it is, was particularly surprising to us um, when we did the surveys. Um, but the thing to really notice here 
is the difference between how positive faculty and staff feel about student learning, about faculty teaching and about administrative processes and the opportunity to use AI to enhance those things versus the leadership. This delta that exists between the front line and the leadership is very, very common in AI. We've been seeing this for a decade. Uh, but this is a big spread. This is probably bigger than we were expecting. That there's a that the further you are away from the front line, from the core of the uh, the granular decisions, the less excited, that the more excited you are about using AI. Now, there's a few reasons for that. You can argue it a couple of different ways. Some of it is going to be about um, concerns about. Uh, uh, cheating and plagiarism and academic integrity. Some of it's going to be concerns about uh, just the sheer disruption. Um, and leadership tends to have that bias to look further and be um, looking at a higher level over time. So what's really important to understand about this is this difference exists, that there is a a different attitude to the a different level of optimism towards how uh, people in the classroom and people at the front line feel about um, using artificial intelligence. And there's a, this is a complex, multi-layered sort of system because we end up worrying a lot about the effectiveness of AI as a learning partner. Does it um, make people smarter or make people dumber? Does it allow people to learn at their own pace as is promised? Or does it actually interrupt that process? And there's a huge amount around skill development and proficiency that continues on into the workplace that we're seeing um, with AI that's kind of new. And that's something that we that we spend a lot of time thinking about in this sort of coupling between higher education and what um, employers are expecting. Uh, the final thing is around... Oh, sorry. The final thing is around the impact on inclusivity and equity, which uh, is only going to become uh, more of a concern as more people adopt subscription models um, and as there's a, a, a greater sort of emphasis on, on how people expose the fact they're using AI in either the workplace or in education. Next slide, please. So again, data from Oregon. Uh, what are the primary concerns re regarding the use of AI in student learning? And the, the, the top two that really stand out, undermining the development of critical thinking skills and creating an over-reliance on technology. And of course, widening the di digital divide as we've spoken about. Now, the interesting thing is to, to, to imagine sort of flipping this upside down and saying, well, what does that say about the opportunity? And immediately the opportunity becomes uh, how can we develop critical sk thinking skills using these tools? You've seen here about the hallucinations, about um, the fabrications, about what we call um, automation bias, which is when we have a propensity to take, um, the inf take the answer from the machine, even though there's strong evidence to the contrary. It's a very human reaction to technology and creating an over-reliance on technology. I can't do this without ChatGPT anymore. That's the sort of essence of the, of the intimacy economy is we, we really, we've outsourced so much of our cognition, we don't know how to go to back. They're competitive technologies rather than complementary. But this does speak to a pretty big new opportunity. How do we teach critical thinking skills? What are they in the age of, of generative AI? And how do we create the right kind of reliance on technology, the right kind of trust? Embedded in this are a whole series of questions for the individual, for companies and organizations and um, institutions and for society overall about what what skills do we choose to keep as human skills? Very important questions that we dig into. Um, and how do we, what do we believe are the main equity and accessibility challenges? This issue of digital divide, uh, when we did this survey uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the summer, um, that was a big deal. I think it's an even bigger deal now because of we're starting to see uh, almost a, um, a, a, a default standard emerging that um, premium products to get the best model 
premium products to get privacy, to get protection in your own data. Those are um, those are that's a different kind of of internet than we had. And bias and algorithms. Um, this is very firmly lodged in the in the public um, consciousness now, to the point that there are you know kind of mainstream memes about it. But uh, it has not been solved. It probably never will be. They are inherently uncomfortable conversations, and it requires more diversity uh, in in. Uh, development of these systems and in use of these systems and in the design of these systems to solve this problem. Next slide, please. So just to talk about uh, for a minute about um, plagiarism and cheating and those kinds of things. We don't have a lot of data. The best data in education is actually for high schools um, out of Stanford. And it does show that since the introduction of these tools, particularly ChatGPT, there has not been a significant increase in cheating. Cheating is and, and plagiarism is a different kind of driver in the high school community. Um, the data is a little bit different and a little bit a little bit less robust and a little bit more fragmented in higher education. Um, but it still sort of calls to the sense that that um, cheating and plagiarism is driven by more than just access to a tool. Um, uh, there has been some interesting work done around uh, AI detection accuracy. And the short answer is it doesn't work. It doesn't work now. Now, this is changing. There are new tools coming out that potentially are more accurate. But the problem is that even, if you look on the left, even with a human um, a human written text at 96% accurate, there's still a 4% false positive rate, which is very high and falls disproportionately on on people whose second language is English. It's about a double false positive rate for that group. If you put AI generated text in, uh, you'll, the, the, the detection rate's about 74%. This is a big study out of uh, university in Europe. If you put AI in, and then you AI text in and then you subsequently do human manual edit, a 42% detection accuracy. But here's the real one that's sort of absolutely astonishing. You take AI-generated text and then you edit it with a uh, machine on top of that. It's just so low. It's just barely, you know, you just you, you just don't even you rule this out as, an, as a viable option for detection. So we're sort of say very strongly that you can't rely on these tools to detect AI text, so you have to do something else. And how else to think about it? That's one of the big challenges over the next year for people is to transition the mindset from having to detect AI text to actually working in the in instructional forms with, uh, with AI as part of that system. Next slide, please. Another thing that people worry about, of course, is the occupational effect. And back in 2019, a group out of Princeton did uh, a, a significant study about the impact on occupations of artificial intelligence. This did not include generative AI. And we've highlighted in pink the um, area, the, the groups that are um, in, in higher education. And then in 20. 23, they redid the study. Next slide, please. And this was the results, including generative AI. Now, obviously, there's a lot more granularity in these in, in these um, occupations. But nevertheless, it's strongly <laughs> indicative that higher education at an occupation level uh, is massively affected by artificial intelligence can see that that's pretty astonishing. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of promise and peril, we sort of, I mean, it's always a good way to talk about AI is to just contrast these two. And we divide these into teaching, learning, research, and administration. And the perils are, you know, turning teachers into policemen, turning learning for students to be really robotic and hands-off, taking away that desirable difficulty, taking away that sense of um, mastery and achievement. Um, research, a continuation of the crisis of knowledge, 
um, with things like reproducibility and um, statistical uh, issues with the, with the way that we, what we consider to be a significant result. Uh, and in administration, the inequality of access, you can see how that would become a do nothing. That's just going to get worse with bias in the data and algorithms. But the promise, and the promise is real, um, the, the, uh, for teaching, being able to take more dynamic approaches, uh, customizable learning pathways, new curricula, there's a lot of tools out there, a lot of grassroots tools for um, rapidly creating new curricula, rapidly creating uh, things just for your for particular students in particular situations. Um, there's uh, very um, uh, compelling sort of stories about uh, teachers and instructors that have been able to save a lot of time and be able to spend more time with um, students one-on-one. -on -one. But the data is very much anecdata. There isn't a lot of like core evidence in this year. Learning the same thing, but the 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 adaptive feedback makes sense. There's a an agency. There's a um, Socratic process that you can get these chatbots to engage in that are um, that are quite compelling. They can take you through the process of of forming an explanation. Um, they can help people ask those stupid questions that they worry about whether or not they're being um, judged for. And novel compositions for self-expression, uh, those are those are fun. They bring some uh, joy and fun and novelty back into um, many processes. Um, research, we're seeing the start of some very interesting novel material structure work, and there's a great um, promise in terms of uh, changing the way that we uh, talk across disciplinary domains and who has access to and who can bring expertise to hard problems but from other areas driven by data-driven analysis uh, of the, um, if you like, the, the sort of problem landscape. And administration looks very much like what people care about in corporate world, enhanced productivity and service quality. Can you develop better career development processes and enhance student support and success? There's a lot of activity in this area uh, that is really quite promising. Next slide, please. Now, we just want to give you a glimpse into the world of workflows because we spend a lot of time thinking about um, what's going to happen to jobs. Um, we've been in, deep in the research of this, doing our own research since 2015. Now, this is a big change, and we want to we, we're sort of stepping back from it um, at the start of this year, simply because there's a huge uh, uh, there's there's a lot lot of opportunity for deep research in this area. The studies so far are very new, but um, we will be, we've got sort of an overarching framework that we follow. So next slide, please. So its impact on work is very multifaceted, but at its core, it's really about productivity and it involves um, making decisions as individuals and as organizations about how we're going to adopt these tools. We think about it along two sort of different um, uh, dimensions, the worker or the, per the, the, the proficiency of the individual versus the skill that they have to master. If you have high task skill and high proficiency, you're using these tools, you're amplifying or augmenting your own ability to get through the work and to, to, to learn as well. Uh, if you have a high heart task skill, low proficiency, you're bootstrapping. It's a little bit like someone who's not a, a, a programmer teaching them, using these tools to um, do more programming than they otherwise would. If you have low task skill, but high proficiency, you're time saving. So a writer just back and forth editing as they go using the chat GPT to, to edit work. And if the task skill and the work product proficiency is low, it's a prosthetic. So someone writing simple social media posts, you're just quickly rattling through this, automating those things. It's a true prosthetic. So we spend a lot of time figuring out how to think about this and looking at um, whether the, the early research from 2023 which is that these uh, tools are a proficiency enhancer, stands as the studies go broader. Next slide, please. 
finally, for me, we think about how to how to conceptualize using these tools. What are they going to make us better at? How do we become, how do we think uh, more abstractly about uh, enhancing our own abilities, getting into that top right-hand box of amplification, um, exploring. We have access to all this digitized human knowledge. As long as we understand how they make mistakes, this exploration process is so much easier and faster and so much more human and synthesized for us. Segmenting, how to help us break tasks to make them more achievable, super helpful for learners. Weaving, putting together these things to in this combinatorial power. We see this in science as massively um, valuable. Creating, using different modes, being able to do things you've never been able to do, becoming a coder and building websites when you've never been able to do that, hugely useless skill. Um, iterating, being able to go back and forth between these tools to create and improve outputs. Fusing, helping to bring together complex and conflicting information. Incredibly useful way of using these tools because it has access to so much depth of expertise that we would otherwise not have. Um, and reflecting, sharpening our own cognitive skills and metacognitive self-awareness. We see people use these tools quite effectively for a lot of coaching, and that's a lot of the promise of uh, in, in learning. Next slide, please. Two more quick topics to go through. First is AI inside. So slip to the next slide. So uh, when you talk about generative AI today, you're most likely thinking about ChatGPT, right? And it's been an explosion. It's the fastest growing digital tool. Uh, it's gotten 100 million users within a couple of months. What's going to happen over the next year plus is uh, the progression of AI moving from standalone novel tools that you have to go to that's new to AI being embedded inside massive tools that we already use. And you get an order of magnitude more people being access, having access to these tools as Microsoft puts co-pilot into Office 360, which has you know, a billion plus users. Google embeds their AI inside of Google Workspace and Gmail, which has a couple billion users. The, the potential for the explosion of access to these tools tools is going to happen. And so this creates a, a, a large strategic question. In the past, when you wanted to regulate how much or uh, people were using these tools, you chose a particular domain and an I team could turn it off. Um, now you can't really do that because it's just going to be embedded everywhere. That also creates a lot of possibility and potential, though, because everyone's going to have access to these tools and the, uh, these technologies and the tools they're already using. One more point. Next slide, please is a question of knowledge and how we actually gain knowledge and what's changing here for us with this world of AI. Last slide, please. You think about the, those three phases. We, we grew from the world of the internet, which had uh, everyone had access to lots of information aggregated by institutions around the world. We'd go to a journalism site. We'd go to a, uh, back in the day, Encyclopedia Britannica was online. Those kinds of things were, content was brought together in major websites and we could access it through that. In the social world, we moved to being able to access content created by the many. Anyone is posting on social media and you can access all of this. That created quite a challenge, though, in terms of knowledge, because we went from a world where there were where there was um, people who were editing and, and managing and, and gatekeeping that content to be able to try and make sure it's accurate to the many and anybody can say anything without any consequence. The next world that we're going, moving into is is more complex. We have large machines like a single in instance of ChatGPT, but we will also see many, 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 many smaller versions and our own custom digital partners that are AIs creating this uh, incredible complex network of knowledge. Are we getting it from other people? Are we getting it from machines? Are we getting it from the same machine or someone else's machine? This has a profound impact on our discovery and our knowledge and our learning. Where is the information coming from? How do we know whether that information is what we want and what we can actually trust? And how are we learning from it? As we outsource so much of our cognition, we, we lose that ability to actually to gather information, make a prediction, judge that prediction, and take an action, and then learn from that as that cycle. If what we're doing is just gathering information from a machine and acting on it, how much are we actually learning? Or perhaps the other way is, how can we still be learning while using that information? 
Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. We'd love to um, hear other questions. As you think about it, yes, please go to that last slide. Um, as, you, as you think about questions, we would like you to reflect again and just think about your excitement to fear ratio. So we asked you at the beginning, nice moment to just take a time and say, has, has that excitement to fear ratio changed at all? And if so, why? But thank you very much for your attention. We'd love to um, uh, hear any questions and answer them if we can. Dave, Helen, thank you very much for um, that informative presentation. And, and Commissioner Christian, Joe, thank you for putting that together. Uh, any comments or questions from members of the board related to the presentation? Sure, Chair Buchanan, it's Lauren. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, I guess uh, one question is, this is kind of missing recommendations. Um, you know, where do you, th if you had any off, you know, <clears throat> recommendations for a board like ours? And then secondly, you know, who who have you seen in the in the world of university systems that's um, in the forefront of, of usage, adopted guidelines, policies at this point? Great question. I, I, so, well, I'd start with the, the, in terms of recommendations, is to recognize the difference uh, with this technology versus anything prior. Prior, you'd be able to look at software, test it, see how it works, be able to make sure that it works across everyone, and it will work the same way for as long as you're using it until you actually go through an upgrade. This world is different, and so our advocacy is that to approach this as a continuous learning journey. So we work with people on a monthly basis to bring them up to speed on what happens, what's changed, what are new use cases. This is both because the technology is changing so much, but also because as this complex system that we live in and work in evolves, the way the technologies actually work within the system is going to be changing. This is a truly emergent system because it's a complex human system, but the machines themselves are emergent. And so taking a longer term view, we do think that it's be the best practices is having an AI task force. Uh, and so happy to hear about that. Um, and uh, that because it brings a diverse set of ideas and people together to actually think about it. This is not just a technology, right? This is not something that can, that, um, that can just be looked at like another IT purchase. This is something that uh, pervades everyone in the way that they learn and work. So bringing people together that can actually look at that whole system is important. Finally, we actually uh, we advocate a, a broad based learning because um, the people at the edge of the system, in this case, the students who are learning, the faculty who are teaching, the admi administrators who are using it for processes, they will both find the, po the, the, the promise and the peril more so than any uh, centralized group. So making sure everyone has as much exposure is important. There have been studies that showed that um, that training and understanding this technology is very important, but there is some sort of learning curve that has to go through that just a little bit of training that gives people a false sense of security can actually be a problem, whereas much more in-depth understanding of how the technology truly works is where you get the true power. Yeah, I'd add to that with, um, it's very important to establish it, that sort of early common language. Um, one of the things that we've seen over many years um, with artificial intelligence is that it tends to bring a, a, a the best practice is to have a diverse group with people who have no idea what it is and people who are extremely like steeped and expert. The, the, but what when those groups get the most functional is when they've got a common language that everybody actually is talking the same, you know, talking the same language about this technology. And that's quite challenging um, in artificial intelligence because you can have, uh, you know, a, a, a faculty member who's extremely experienced in things like, you know, and is able to talk in really technical terms about reinforcement learning and lots of lots of sort of technical jargon. And you can have people who ha have no desire to even know any of that. What they really want to talk about is how this is impacting them as a human. How is it, why are the, the sorts of conversations that they might be having with their kids about this, the worry about what jobs are going to be. So the big one of the big challenges is that you've got to allow the conversation to be really broad but at the same time be really functional. So that common language, that setting a common platform is really important, which is 
what we try and do in this keynote, right? To get every, you have it, we sort of shift the language around so it's kind of non technical in that respect. The next piece is recognizing that there is a, a, a very, because it's a complex system with a cultural um, overlay, a cultural element to this, that um, when it comes to uh, deciding on what to do, it's a mix of, it's, you've got to get the right balance between some kind of top down policy statements that are guidelines that help people get it, kind of get their head around it. If you've got places that you definitely don't want to use this technology or you definitely want to use this technology or policies around um, how it's going to be used in terms of privacy or bias, you know, those kinds of things. Um, those sort of top-down things have to be flexible enough that uh, and and pretty light-handed to the point that um, the local decisions, right down to the individual people who are self-organizing around, um, you know, we like the way this particular instructor allows us to use ChatGPT, or we like the way that this particular lab or this particular course is building my competence in um and becoming a more professionally a competitive student or a competitive professional so it it has to allow for this very distributed um, local decision making but at the same time have have the guardrails that come from the top down so that's that's what the ai task forces when they're working well are doing are creating that sort of top level framework so that um, people can self-organize and learn and put in their own sort of distributed control system if you like so that's, that's sort of how we think about that please um Can I follow up chair buchanan please read your bell so so in terms of definitions like are, you know is this re, i mean are, are we really talking about generative ai today or you know i thought these large language models are really kind of a pattern recognition right um where they go out and they take massive amounts of data use massive amounts of computing power and and come up with with answers that meet a criteria and, and i guess the answers over time you know depending on what the reception they may slightly self-correct self-correct well first of all am i accurate in that assumption and two what what aspect of that is generative? Well, they've read the entire internet is the first thing to sort of consider. And as they as they predict the next word or the next token is sort of the technical thing, they're they're creating, they're generating that. They're not exactly taking that data. Um, and then just regurgitating it. They're taking the, the context and they're allowing some degree of um, not so much randomness, but certainly uh, flexibility across that prediction. That's what creates that, um, that ability, that hallucination, but it also creates human-like text. It, it is creative. There's about 20, sort of a, there's a, there's a, um, a number called the temperature which at about 0.8 out of one um, produces empirically, they don't really know why, produces this creative human-like text. And as the models have got bigger, as they've gone from chat from GPT 3.5 to GPT 4, that um, creative process, if you like, that generative process has started to be um, a little bit less predictable than uh, researchers and designers originally and uh, thought would happen and originally anticipated. And we have seen um, there is this is still um, up for debate, um, but we are seeing some degree of uh, emergent phenomena and the the. De depending on um, sort of what camp you follow from a research perspective, um, there are uh, signs that the, a lot of the conversation here will be switching to what are these things, what is the emergent phenomena from these models and why? Are they learning and are they building um, world, are they building models inside themselves? Are they generalizing in ways that are unexpected? And we we have multiple points of evidence that um, that this generalization process is real. Uh, we still don't know exactly uh, how much 
true new emergent phenomena are occurring. There's a little bit of it having to do with the type of metric that you test and, and, and that you test these models on. But as they become more multimodal, as they become bigger, there's a thing called the scaling laws where every time they go up by, uh, it's totally predictable, the the um, the type of accuracy you get, the growth in, in um, capabilities you'll get as they scale. Uh, the, the 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 really the the really big thing that could happen is more of this emergent phenomena starts to happen they develop capabilities that are beyond what was expected and that's part of the discussion around the process of moving towards and part of the you know the big deltas and in, in, uh, in, in um, uncertainty over when and if we ever see sort of some sort of artificial general intelligence. Are they thinking like humans? No, not at all. Um, they are, uh, are giant pattern recognizers. But what it says is, wow, there's a lot of power in computing and there's a lot of power in language for um, actually mimicking our cognition. And when we use these to uh, mimic our own cognition or to enhance our own cognition in, com in com combination with search and creativity, what we're seeing out of that is being able to do a lot more with less, especially if you're relatively new to a field and you are um, able to rapidly learn something new, do a process that you've never done before, become more productive on something. Now, of course, you don't spot the errors. That's the risk. Of course. Uh, but that's that's kind of how we see that. Thank you. That was helpful. But but if, if, uh, still, if I understand you correctly, the idea of this emergent phenomena is is a little bit in the near future, but it's still the future. Like, I, can we give an example today of something where we say, okay, that is a brand new development from from um, ChatGPT? Because I know we talk, we talk about the like you talk about them in drug development, right? But I, I mean. Yeah. You know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen anything yet. But am I, have I just missed it? Oh, well, there's a couple of different things to pull apart there. Um, in a, in a say a large language model, the um, there's there's sort of the, the the canonical paper from last year was actually disputing these emergent phenomena. The top paper at Europe's was about how these emergent phenomena are an artifact of the metric that the um, researcher chooses to test the model on. So earlier in the year, there was a, um, a, a lot of noise and a lot of excitement about a paper that came out showing these, these super emergent phenomena. So instead of being a um, log linear, uh, this, you know, on a benchmark test for math or for language or what have you, that these, uh, that suddenly we get to GPT-4 and boom, up the, and hockey sticks up and um, on all of the benchmarks the researchers are saying wow these things are suddenly GPT-4 has exploded then the paper came out from Stanford which was then um, presented at Europe's at late last year saying these um, these emergent phenomena are an artifact of choosing a non-linear metric not a linear metric and there's a lot of technicalities under this that that, that is like you know that is a um it, it, it's pretty solid finding, right? So, but nevertheless, the complexity researchers, and there's a number of them, they're the ones saying, hang on a minute, we know they're not thinking, we know this isn't cognition, there's no true meaning here, but we are starting to see what um, that these models, these powerful AIs, whether they're generative or whether they just... Um, by reinforcement learning and being and, and sort of deep combinatorial search, which are more of the drug discovery um, and material science type discovery ones, that they are starting to find um, areas of complexity and nonlinearity in the search space. And that that uh, process, so that the, 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 one of the ideas is that Instead of looking for um, simple answers inside of the models, they're looking for simple processes that sit on top of these high dimensional spaces. So it gets pretty technical pretty quickly. And I think that 20, you know, in the next year, this is going to be a really active area of research. Are these things really 
are having these small areas in hyperdimensional space where they're learning something really and they're, they're doing something that is almost, you could sort of say autonomous, but it's not really, it's more have they discovered a, a more efficient way of learning, a more efficient learning algorithm. And um, Jeffrey Hinton, who invented backpropagation, who resigned from Google last year so that he could talk more openly about the perils of this, um, his view, his stated view is that um, that backpropagation might be a more efficient learning algorithm than how the human brain has evolved to learn. And what happens when you put more compute, uh, more data, and essentially remove constraints because these things have no constraints. Our constraints are that we have a limited lifespan. We've got to eat. We've got to sleep. Our brain, our skulls are only this big. But what happens if you, these things are essentially unconstrained? What happens when they use these more efficient learning algorithms? We just don't know. So to the extent that your question is, do we know or is it still to be discovered? The, la the still to be discovered is the right, is the answer. Super, thank you. <clears throat> um, I regent to. Uh, can I ask one more question? Thank you, Regent. Sure. I think it'll be a short one. Please. Uh, so, so where do we think we end up on computer processing power? You know, uh, at this point, right? I mean, we went through all this big, all the Bitcoin mining and all the crypto mining, and we and we quickly had a, an ESG problem with with that. And, and one of the reasons I understood that OpenAI is with Microsoft is because Microsoft committed so much of their NVIDIA chips and and their computer process to the to that. Where does it, are we in an arms race on that? And and how will we see that? you know, as the public or as a university system develop over time? I think there's a two-part answer to that question. First part, you're total, I think I completely agree with you. We're in a, uh, it is, you could see it as a an arms race. I think about it as a capital race, right? We, we, we one of our obsessions is capital capture because there's an extraordinary, the, the, the major drivers of this, of this change are large companies mostly because they're the only ones who have the large capital. There are a few venture capital and private equity firms that are large enough to really finance this. Um, but you see large pools of capital financing an extraordinary amount of compute. Um, and uh, they are essentially, essentially trying to um, get a return on that investment through capturing the value of labor. And that's why we call it capital capture. Today, it is dominated by big tech financing primarily NVIDIA for chips. In that world, the data center world, there are many competitors that are emerging for uh, NVIDIA, and we'll see how well they do. Uh, NVIDIA has a you know a huge technology advantage, but there will be more competitors. There is a shift that we're anticipating, we're starting to see, but we think it's important and it could be quite important for this, for this, you know, for your institution and across the system, which is that um, there's two parts of the compute that are important. There's the training, which happens in large data centers, huge compute, can be hundreds of millions of dollars to actually train the large models. There is a separate world, which is inference. So as you prompt and respond, that's called the inference cost. That can also be quite expensive. And you can see the cost that comes through APIs and the, the cost escalates um, uh, as, the, as the capability goes up because it's remembering more. But there's a shift of moving um, inference to the edge. And so we have another obsession we call AI at the edge. And this is, a, this is really focused on companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft, who have all developed chips for their edge devices, whether those are computers or phones, and they're developing um, uh, models, specific models for the edge or acceleration of large models at the edge. So this year, um, Apple's usually quite quiet about what they're doing, but they released quietly some developer frameworks that accelerate um, large open source models. One that got a lot of attention is Stable Diffusion, which is a large image generation model. And that's been accelerated to run on their A and M chips, which are in your phone or in your computer. That allows that inference to happen at the edge. And that changes the dynamic of the sort of capital race of who's actually able to use the tools. It reduces the cost of using the tools because you've already paid for the compute when you buy your phone. 
You're not sending that to a data center and having to pay for that compute to happen there. It's happening on your phone. So this is a progression that we think we'll see. Um, we also have seen dedicated server boxes that are being developed um, so that institutions can have a, a, a server in their rack that is specifically designed for uh, for generative AI. Uh, and they is so much so that they can come preloaded with a software stack that includes lots of open source tools. Again, another thing, we're not paying those large tech companies for each inference in your data centers because you actually own the box yourself. So this world is, I think your, your question is dead on in terms of where we are, but we anticipate this is shifting and changing over the next couple of years. Well, the sustainability part of it too is, is really important. Um, and uh, the, the getting a handle on exactly how much electricity and exactly how much water these things use is very is difficult. But the research is uh, the research has been done. There's a very strong push to understand this. Um, it's probably going to be something that becomes um, more more in a lot driven by transparency. There is so much pressure to reduce water and electricity use on these things. They are very hungry. I mean, a, a eight ounce bottle of water for twenty. 20 prompts or 20 something. 20 prompts. Yeah. I mean, that they are, um, that fundamentally, it's an unsustainable. If you took the track from last year, I think we were going to have, what was the GDP number? Oh. Extraordinary explosion. Uh, just yeah. uh, just the most ridiculous amount of, of electricity going into running AI models. Um, but all of these, all of the research, a lot of the research direction is to more efficient algorithms, um, more efficient models, more efficient training, uh, and so I, you know, we, 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 the big models will still be really big, but we'll see much more efficiency um, develop. I think so. Super. Thank you. Thank you both very much, Commissioner Christian. Yeah, maybe I can help us transition a little bit too. But I, I think to Regent Bao's early question, this is obviously first step in what we think is a, a significant task ahead of us. We have uh, sort of next steps engaged. The Edwards will also be helping uh, with a full day workshop and more if need be. We've, we've got them engaged to work with this task force that we're standing up. I think I like Helen's response. It, you know, as broad as this is, as fast as it's moving, we, we need to get our arms around it, but it also has to be very Montana based down to uh, campus level, classroom level. There, Nobody said it yet, but there's also questions around academic freedom, how classes will be taught, what will, you know, down to those preferences that we need to make sure we're getting the right amount of feedback. We, we purposely are without a lot of recommendations at this step, because I think this task force has to work uh, with, with the Edwards as consultants and others to try to bring the questions to the table, but then create some sort of Montana university system specific answers that we come back to this board with and say, you know, we, we need to leave this to the campus, we need to leave it to faculty, or we need to create board policy that that, that uh, creates some guidelines. I, I would suspect the latter, but um, I, I think those are questions that we want to answer at a very grassroots level in Montana as we move forward and and, and come up with uh, those solutions and and, and move, uh, move the university system forward to engage what I think is a very interesting opportunity and an and incredible uh, learning experience ahead of us. We, we just need to know how that interacts. Very well said, you know, definitely necessary we engage. Any other comments or questions? Please. Just, yeah, okay. just uh, one, one thing to underscore, um, you know, higher education is kind of known for not moving very quickly. And I think based on what we just learned and what kind of what we all know, this is rapidly changing how we think, how we do what we do, how we do what we do. Um, I, I would just want to kind of put an asterisk on the um, the task force. I'm glad we got that. It makes sense that we have it. They're meeting already, um, but that we have to move pretty darn quickly to be able to to do you know to sort of quell any of the the negative side of the use of AI in higher education, but to really tap into it mm -hmm. in meaningful ways. Yeah. And maybe another comment with regard to higher education. One thing that I guess gives me a, just a little bit of concern. We have 8,000 employees. Um, they're all at different campuses, all different cultures, um, all serving in different functions. And that 
AI is going to be a part of everything that we do down to every staff member, to, mm. to every faculty, that the work of the task force has got to penetrate all community members across the, the system. And I think that's going to be our biggest challenge. Sure. Uh, the task force can do some amazing things. It could bring to us some ideas on, on the policy. It can elevate some of the, the cool teaching and learning things. But if it doesn't get to everybody, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just a little worried that, you know, the, our quality of higher education could be impacted in, in a negative way or our competitiveness as a system could be impacted. So that's the, I guess the prompt to the task force, prompt to this board and to OG is let's move quickly and let's be as inclusive mm -hmm. as we can be across all the, the actors in our system. Well said. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and, well and that's certainly on our horizon. I mean, that's exactly what I think the direction that's been given to Deputy Commissioner and, and the task force is and those things don't go well together, right? Being incredibly inclusive and moving quickly, but right. we we need to do that, and and we need uh, we need more conversations around this and in front of this board, uh, uh, not in not in the long term, but in the short term. And that's our goal. Rich Rogers, um, to piggyback on what Regent Lozar was saying, so what I'm hearing is <clears throat> there's going to be a continuous learning environment. The AI task force is going to be central to this component. And so my only curiosity here is sort of what best practices are developing nationally in AI task force? Like what strategies are we pursuing? Are we having private sector individuals on that task force? Like what's the make of the composition and how are we ensuring that we're going to be having a holistic approach? I appreciate that we have national um, consulting experts that are going to guide some of our work, uh, but making sure from a Montana based solution that we're, having the right folks at the table. I, Regent Rogers, I, I think that's our concern, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, I think the consultants will bring that national lens. They work with other educators. Um, we'll certainly look for best practice around the, the education community, but this goes so much beyond just what we do every day that uh, we, we need to incorporate that in. And, and we will continue to engage um, Edwards or whatever national consultants we need to make sure that uh, we understand the national landscape and then try to create Montana solutions. Mm -hmm. Please. Just, just another resource to throw out there. The state, <clears throat> state CIO, Kevin Gilbertson, has been really engaged in this nationally with the, the, his network of other CIOs in other states. So he might have some resources for you guys as well. Thanks, Dylan. That's a great point. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Helen, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Sounds like we're going to stay engaged a bit with you. We appreciate it. Great questions from members of the board. Really good presentation. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Teal and Deputy Commissioner Christian for bringing that. I'm um, Superintendent Artson. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Very much appreciate it. We look forward it. to your remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, very going to be a very promising end to a 23-20 school year. We're <clears throat> very, very looking good. It's looking great right now at this point. I do want to bring up that I do have a packet of 14 pages if you want to go into it, but I just want to get timing back on and everything else, so I'll be very short and sweet. Thank you again for this opportunity. Um, Perkins State Plan is moving, and I think that partnership is exceedingly important, and I thank you for the leadership with that. Um, I also uh, want to share that um, our MAST, our alternative student testing, we are one-third, so... 20,000 of our 60,000 students are doing a through-year assessment five times a year in math and reading. Um, that's in a third through eighth grade. Next year, all of our students will be moving through that in third through eighth. But the ACT is still out there. That's where we really have to begin a discussion early and have probably more frequent discussions on what does it mean at the federal level, I must do a secondary assessment. And it I don't have a through year in that high school, you know, view at this point. So I'd really like to roll up our sleeves, have a little bit more meeting time that we can really ferret out what does it mean to do that. Um, also, just a little also bit of a note, we take count by statute of students that have been enrolled 10 days prior. We do it in the um, very first week of October, it's going to be happening in February. The count always seems to be lower in our spring count. I am 1,700 students lower. 
Mm. And it's trending even more so. And what does that mean for you when you open up that opportunity for high school in that bridge to you? So we've done some research. We've asked quite a few things. I get a lot of data from DPHHS. I have birth data. I trend data. We do all those things. Uh, Yes, was there um, pandemic problems? Were there challenges when children left? We saw a quite rise of students in high school leave and go elsewhere. We also have checked with our 117 private schools that we have that are K-12, and uh, they also are trending down. Our homeschool numbers from county, I get them once a year. I get them in the fall. They're trending down. We know we're an aged state, but I think we need to really have a a discussion on what does 1,700 students mean? Who are they? Where are they? And and what demographic are they that we can really do some targeting with? Attendance does have an indication. And so I don't get that granular daily attendance. I only look at that statue. But, and I don't want this to be, you know, a, a challenge but I think we need to talk about this as well. What does this mean for the future? Teacher residency, I shared with you this morning when we were with the chamber. Thank you for the partnership with University Western. Uh, Thank you to the legislature for recognizing quality teachers in a classroom. We have to grow our own. And this this model of having that fourth year in a whole year teacher residency program um, is there. I still am hoping for 60. I only have 20. So my growth model is kind of stagnant. So maybe there's a way we can accelerate it by sharing, um, I don't know, in PSAs or things like this to really get students interested in education. Love what you said, that you're honoring that pedagogy and how it's distributed across campuses. want to also say that um, when it comes to um, state data, You know, I know we have the House Bill 949 discussion, and I'm going to hold firm that the data that we do put up to share with the university system and Department of Labor are things that are given to by statute or by Fed and protected by FERPA. We have had communication with you. I believe we meet monthly. Would really like those robust discussions and with what also is happening here. I think... I'd love to have somebody in K-12 on that task force. We have a data security officer. If that that could even be part of that to welcome in, what is that next step? What does it mean to have teaching and learning in some sort of artificial intelligence? Because it's hitting, it's not just going to hit 18-year-olds and above. That phone, my granddaughter at 10, just had a birthday yesterday, got one of these. So it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So I know I want to get you back on track with everything else. Um, The one thing is, and um, I get a longitudinal data grant, and I am going to ask for a one-year more extension. It's going to allow me um, $1.5 million. This is for tribal colleges. I know that's not necessarily under your uh, your umbrella, but you do network. And it is not for K-12. It's to see what that opportunity after K-12 to see where we are within that demographic, and then also to see how it flows to a four-year and where it might flow to the workforce. So I would like to have more discussion as we ask for that no-cost extension on what does it really mean. The challenges are getting data from tribal colleges. So I work with tribal government, but if there's any way that we can have a partnership in understanding where that is, so we can amplify post-secondary education, I'm in. So I'll be submitting that by the end of the month, and I might ask for a letter of recommendation, even though I know it's not under your purview. But we're all here about education, and we want to bring up all Montanans, and I think this is something that is extremely important. I uh, was so engaged by this conversation. I thank you for allowing me to listen to this. I have so many questions. And I know that um, from being a legislator for more than a decade, it's, uh, it's an interesting thought. You were spot on. We want to do it in a Montana way. And making sure that we do it right, 
but the acceleration that I'm hearing, it's going to be so quick. If I could add one or excuse me, two words, transparency to the public, and we need to be nimble. In other words, as you had said, um, it is so important that we recognize and we go through all the entire breath from um, anybody in the university system or anybody in teaching and learning all the way to leadership. And I saw that gap on one of the slides. Um, I'm adding in then the layer of what is happening um, with policymakers, whether it's Montana policymakers or federal ones. What exactly is that going to trickle down? And we have to be nimble and work and be transparent to Montanans. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and go to my other job. <laughs> and I thank you for um, allowing me this opportunity. We do have a great partnership. And I know we can be um, even deeper, more ingrained in this because we're in it to win it for our students, whatever age they are. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Superintendent Arnson, thank you for joining us. Um, we appreciate your constant presence in our meetings and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Blessings to all. Likewise. Travel safe. Um, with that, we'll move on to the rest of our agenda. Um, as we do by practice, we'll entertain the entire consent agenda as one motion. Uh, before we do that, we'd like to invite Provost Makwa uh, to, to talk a little bit about the Faculty Emeriti being presented by MSU. Mr. Mock, are you with us this morning? And any update from? He's in transit now. Gotcha. We'll give him a second. <laughs> while, while he's doing that, uh, one piece of recognition I forgot to, to make, and I want to thank uh, President Bodnar for hustling back from Frisco, Texas. Congratulations to your university. I will com I will confess as a Bobcat, I was even wearing gray and maroon on Sunday, and <laughs> up with Montana. Pretty exciting road, road for you guys. Congratulations. I want to ask him to come off. Uh, Pro Provost Makwa, it sounds like you might be on mute. Or it sounds like we're waiting for you to requ uh, accept a request. Then send finally in. And it's good. We can go to action and then come back, come back to that. It's easy. Yeah. Okay. Leanne, unless you're saying we're about to go, we may skip over consent and jump into action. Okay. Well, then we'll table consent for a moment. Um, that would bring Deputy Commissioner Trevor to the table to entertain our first action item, Action A, a request for authorization to design and construct parking improvements at MSU. Deputy Commissioner Trevor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, this is a operational uh, facilities item that MSU brings forward uh, in an effort to ensure that existing parking uh, that is anticipated to be displaced on the south end of campus to um, the, the planning and design and construction of uh, a few new academic buildings um, has sufficient replacement, uh, as well as some of the areas around uh, the stadium and expanding those parking lots. Um, the uh, funding for this project is a combination of existing plant funds and auxiliary revenue. We have the experts from MSU online, at least I thought we did, uh, to help answer any of your questions. Uh, Vice President Terry Least and Associate Vice President John Howe uh, stand ready with the details and really the experts on the project. Mr. Chair. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, thank you. Um, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve action item A. So moved. Thank you, Regent Bow. Um, any discussion among members of the board? With this item, please, Regent Lozar. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, quick question, um, maybe for for Tyler. Uh, first off, maybe one comment. I, I'm envisioning, and I very much appreciate the effort to increase the utility of the current space to get more parking, particularly around the stadium. I know that was the discussion we had around um, concerns about parking for the, the hotel, um, you know, a year ago or so. Um, but I'm envisioning like everyone getting out of their car and like barely being able to open their door. So we're just squeezing the parking 
uh, space is tighter. I'm sure that's not going to be the case. Uh, my question here is around the funding of this particular action item. Um, you mentioned it's being funded by these two accounts, uh, but with a potential of financing. And I don't know if we've ever really seen an action item like this, um, where it's like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna use this, these resources for this project, but we also might use something else and we might come back to you uh, a little bit later. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit around what is this potential financing uh, request for down the road? Mr. Chair, Regent Lozar, you're right. Um, that is uh, the case that this is a little bit different in this item, and it's giving the campus the flex the flexibility to use uh, not only the funds that they have been uh, planning for and saving uh, in the plant side of uh, their operations uh, mixed with their auxiliary revenue as they move forward to this project, and if uh, financing terms uh, become favorable, uh, the ability to displace those funds with other financing uh, avenues. Um, we're assured by the campus that they have the funds to complete the project. Uh, and this is really a, a flexibility avenue for them. So with, with regard to uh, the funding for this and the actual work that needs to get done, is that work gonna happen in you know, just in the next year or so? or and and with then what we might we expect a financing ask in the next couple of meetings or I'm just trying to understand sort of the timing on the, the potential financing request. Mr. Chair, Regent Lozart, I think that's a good description of it. It, it is anticipated to uh, take place within the next six months. Um, as we work closer to the summer months, uh, I think we'll hear back from the campus if they were to couple this with other uh, maintenance related campus um, operationally facilities, facilities uh, improvement items um, that they could couple that with the financing associated with this, but uh, really just uh, a flexibility option for the campus. Um, and in the next six months, this project will, will proceed and complete itself. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the plan. Okay, great. Any other questions, comments from members of the board? Questions or comments from uh, other campuses or members of the meeting? Great. Any public comment? Hey, Todd, just maybe. I'm sorry. Regent Southworth, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I, I was just curious. I just, I didn't see it, but it's, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, Terry or John, is there a goal like, um, you know, in quantity of, of added parking spaces? Uh, to this, uh, I'm sure that this is a, you know, you've got a lot of utilities and there's lots of underground obstacles and stuff. So I, I imagine this is kind of a, you know, it's much more complicated than just, you know, three inches of asphalt and striping it. So it's, I just was, didn't know if there was like a, you know, just a goal or a target on, I see 50%, um, you know, stadium lots. I don't know how many of the stadium parks, but I just, uh, just, just more curious than anything, like how, how many, how many stalls are, are are you hoping to to develop out of this? Yeah, Reason Southworth. Um, right now, there's 910 <clears throat> spots out at the stadium lot. Uh, with the current design from our consultant, we're over 1,400. Um, probably in that 1,450 range. We're narrowing down that design as uh, Deputy Commissioner Tyler just mentioned and plan to go out to bid late February with that. And so we'll have a concrete number. Um, it is gravel out there. And so there's a lot of stormwater and drainage uh, grading that we need to do. We'll also be improving lighting out there. Right now we have temporary solar lights uh, just on the, be the east end. And so trying to make this as, as a safe place for all students and staff and faculty who park out there. So it is a comprehensive redo of that entire uh, parking system out there. Again, 910 existing spaces trying to get to 1450 when it's all said and done. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Regent Salver, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Many members of the meeting. All right, seeing no further comment, um, we are taking action today as we go through the agenda. So I'll call for the vote. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. 
Motion passes. Item A has been approved. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, item B is also on your deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the regents. Uh, this is a request in the same vein uh, to address parking. Uh, it's much more maintenance related for the entirety of the campus. It's really part of their ongoing annual maintenance and replacement cycle, uh, $4 million request to conduct a variety of different types of um, maintenance work, crack sealing, pothole filling, striping, uh, seal coating, curb replacement, et cetera. Uh, funds are uh, identical to the above, to the previous item, plant funds and auxiliary revenue. Mr. Chair. Deputy Commissioner Trevor, thank you. And um, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve item B on our action agenda. So moved. Thank you, Regent Yeager. Um, the motion has been forward to entertain item B. Any discussion or corrections from the members of the board? How about uh, any comments or corrections from members of any campuses? Not seeing any. Finally, any public comment on item B or action items? Okay, seeing none, um, we will call for a vote. Those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Action item B is passed. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, thanks, John and Terry, for joining us. And uh, thanks, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, for leading us through that. On to item C. Looks like we're moving to Dr. Jennifer Brown, whose face we see on the meeting. Thank you for joining us. Um, how about you help us understand Action item C, Dr. Brown, thank you. Great, thank you so much. And um, good morning to everyone, Regents, Commissioner Christian and, and colleagues. I am really excited to present this request to plan for an MS in teaching at MSU Northern. Um, this request is in direct response to a very real crisis happening in education across the High Line. And that is that our schools are in desperate need of teachers. Um, so after speaking with superintendents and students and all sorts of folks here up on the High Line, all of our stakeholders, um, we are looking to move forward with a very nimble program that would do three important things. Um, this is an MS in teaching. It is not, does not lead to licensure, um, but it would provide, number one, students interested in gaining a foundation in pedagogy um, to do so um, at the master's level so that they could perhaps teach at the community college level. Um, but the second thing that it does is it provides existing teachers with a path for upskilling. Uh, as you know, that when a teacher is able to obtain a master's degree, that puts them on a different path and it is very beneficial to our teachers to be able to do that. And then the third thing that it does is it gives teachers a chance to gain an endorsement in a different area. So what we find is there are particular content areas that administrators are having a hard time filling. We might have a difficult time finding a math faculty, for example. We might have a difficult time finding a CTE faculty. And in those cases, this gives a teacher in English, for example, the opportunity to get a master's degree um, and also gain an endorsement in one of those high need areas. And that provides flexibility for schools and school districts when it comes to the teachers that um, are already on their rosters. Um, this program does not add at this time any additional cost. Uh, we have very creative faculty. We do operate very lean here up at Northern. And so we have very creative faculty that have um, come up with ways to utilize existing courses um, and to also co-convene um, undergraduate courses with graduate level courses that have been developed. And those courses um, have a common foundation. So we're able to do that. And we're also able to, given the numbers, be very flexible. We have a lot of students that are place bound, especially those that are teachers that are already in uh, teaching in existing school positions. Um, they're very place bound. And so we want to be able to meet them where, we're, where they're at. Um, so in those cases, there will be some programs that will be able to offer some of the courses online, some of them will be high flex. And for those that require in person, uh, we'll certainly do that. Uh, we're looking particularly at some of the industrial arts. Um, 
so we're very passionate about this here at Northern. Our mission is to serve this region and to make sure that the Highline has the resources it needs and the education um, that it deserves. And um, I would love to answer any questions that you might have. Dr. Brown, thank you very much for presenting item C. Um, with that, I would entertain a motion uh, to approve action item C. So moved. Regent Rogers, thank you for the motion. Um, is there any discussion or corrections among members of the board? Yeah, Regent Buchanan, I have a question for Mr. Brown. Um, is this, I, just I'm unclear. Is this open? Is this open to only to existing teachers, or is this open to the general public? No, this is open to anybody. Um, the one uh, kind of aspect of it that I would like to point out, and I and I briefly touched on it, is it does not lead to licensure. So this would not be for somebody who does not have a teaching license that wants to gain a teaching license. Um, this is for somebody that either already has a teaching license, as you're talking about, and wants to move forward in either additional content areas or in a level of higher education attainment. Or it can be taken by anybody that's looking for master's level education that focuses on pedagogy. Um, you might have somebody that wants to focus on pedagogy and writing content that maybe is contemplating going into graduate school um, for law or for um, uh, to get a PhD. So anybody can take it. It's just making sure that it's clear this doesn't lead to licensure. It leads to endorsement. Um, and so that's that's the special uh, distinction there. Okay, one follow up question. So just no, you no. Know, when I when I've seen teachers move on towards a master's, you know, oftentimes they do it online or at times which are you know while they're working since they can't afford to take time off. Is is that what you're envisioning with this? Hmm. Yes. Um, so we built a very or we're in the process of building a very nimble program. Um, so what would happen is if we have teachers that are um, in place, right, and they're they're place bound and they can't come to campus. Um, we're not looking at large numbers. They would be co-convened with an undergraduate class and would join that class online, um, if um, if it's possible. If it's a content area that that's possible. Um, if it's a content area where being in person would be necessary, then that's something that we would need to work with them on. But our faculty are willing to be flexible in modality. We, we listed it as a mixed modality uh, program. Um, in some cases, we might be doing high flex. Maybe some folks are in the classroom and then other folks are joining online. Um, but the point is to provide them what they need where they are. Thank you. Thank you, Regent. Thank you. Regent Rogers, you had a question? <laughs> Thank you, Chair Buchanan. Um, my understanding of the dual enrollment program is that some of the limitations that we have with some of our rural K-12 schools is a lack of master's educated professor, fact, uh, it, educators, searching for that word, educators to uh, be able to support those dual enrollment courses. Um, can you speak to whether or not this degree would help to support increasing access for dual enrollment across our K-12 partners? It certainly could. Um, as teachers pursue master's degrees, they will then have the, the degree and the content area to offer those courses for college credit. Um, and we do have, you know, as you know, some dual enrollment programs that are um, on site at the schools and then others that are online. And if those those teachers were on site with the master's degrees, then they certainly would be qualified to participate. Well, really good questions. Any other questions for members of the board? How about questions or corrections from campuses? How about public comment on action item C? Not seeing any. With that, um, we'll call for the vote. Uh, those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Mo action item C passes. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Brown, for joining us. We appreciate it um, and the hard work. This morning at the chamber meeting, again, teacher shortages was certainly a top priority um, from the workforce and business perspective. So thanks for leaning into the, the task. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if it pleases the board, we'll track back to the consent item.
Um, as mentioned, we typically consider an item in a package. Um, I see Provost Makwa has joined us. Good morning, Provost Makwa. Sounds like you'd like to. Can you hear me okay, Regent Buchanan? Yes, we can. Yes. I'm going to assume that you can because I can't hear you. I'm evidently having some computer problems today. Um, Regent Buchanan, would you wave if you can hear me? All right. Fantastic. I'm going to just plow ahead. And when you want me to stop, wave again. <laughs> Thanks so much. You know, our campuses very much appreciate the opportunity to recognize uh, a significant achievement uh, or faculty who have achieved uh, significant levels of, a, of distinction on our campuses and have served for some lengthy period of time. At MSU, it's at least 15 years. Today, we request authority to bestow uh, emeriti titles to honor two faculty members who have dedicated a significant portion of their career to teaching research and service at Montana State University. I'll start with Professor Marie O'Neill. Marie retired in July 2023 after a 33-year career in the School of Architecture at MSU. Her dedication and exceptional contributions to teaching, scholarship, and service have left an indelible mark on our academic community. Throughout her tenure, Professor O'Neill consistently distinguished herself as a, an exemplary educator and scholar. Hundreds of students who are now practicing architects in Montana and elsewhere have benefited from the opportunities Dr. O'Neill provided through practical service projects in which students learn valuable professional skills while contributing to design projects and locations from Montana across the globe. Projects including projects in India, Ukraine, Thailand, Rome, and, and many other locations. One of Professor O'Neill's most remarkable achievements was her extensive documentation of, of historic agricultural buildings throughout Southwest Montana. It's been a 25, it was a 25 year long ambitious undertaking and resulted in one of the historic American Building Survey's largest acquisition that is now housed in the United States National Archives. Professor O'Neill's continued association with MSU as Professor Emerita will be a source of inspiration for current and future generations of students. Her legacy will contribute to the ongoing success and reputation of our university. So we thank you for your consideration of, of our request for Emerita designation for Professor O'Neill. The second faculty member uh, that I'll describe today is Professor Henry Sorensen. Dr. Sorensen retired in July 2022 after an outstanding career spanning 39 years also with the School of Architecture at MSU. Throughout his tenure, Professor Sorensen played a pivotal role in shaping the academic and professional trajectories of his students. Over the years, the students have won numerous awards for their work uh, working with Professor Sorensen and have just achieved distinguished careers in their own right. Under Professor Sorensen's mentorship, his students have secured almost 100 national and international level awards, including 79 accepted drawing awards and four best in show awards at the Design Communication Association International Juried Competitions. Beyond his teaching accomplishments, Professor Sorensen's scholarly activities have garnered significant recognition. During his tenure at MSU, his work led to 17 awards of excellence and two jurors awards in the American Society of Architectural Illustrators, Archi Architecture in Perspective International Competition. It's a long name, but it's a big deal. Regrettably, Professor Sorensen passed away in early 2023 before the emeritus request could be completed. In light of his immense contributions to our university in the field of architecture, we respectively request Board of Regents approval to confer upon Professor Henry Sorison the rank of Professor Emeritus of Architecture at Montana State University posthumously. 
We believe this posthumous designation will serve as a fitting tribute to Professor Sorensen's unparalleled commitment to excellence in education and scholarship. It will also stand as a lasting acknowledgement of his impact on the School of Architecture and Montana State University. <laughs> so we appreciate your thoughtful considerations of, of both of these requests. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Makwa, for joining us and for sharing some context as we entertain those two emeritus faculty items. Um, as is practice, again, at this point, before we uh, accept a motion to entertain the consent agenda, do any members of the board wish to pull any one item off of this consent agenda for individual consideration? Seeing the answer is no, I would entertain a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda. So moved. Regent Lozar, thank you for the motion. Um, <clears throat> okay, so any discussion or comments from members of the board as it relates to the consent agenda? Any comments or corrections from members of the campuses represented here today? How about public comment, Leanne? Do we have any public comments related to the consent agenda? Not seeing any, thank you. Well, seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. Those in favor of approving the consent agenda as moved, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say aye. aye. Thanks, Jeff. Great, the motion passes. Thank you again for all involved in putting together uh, the consent items. I think that moves us to information items, which with that, Deputy Director Teal, who has his hands on darn near everything going on at the MUS, thank you for taking the time to uh, introduce this information item. Uh, Chair Buchanan, this is going to be the shortest possible information item. These, this is the academic memo. These are academic items that you have delegated to the Commissioner's Office to review alongside uh, all of the Chief Academic Officers of MUS institutions. So these are the items that have moved through that process since you last met in November, uh, just to formalize them for campuses so that they can continue with the development and launch of these academic programs and work with their accreditors. Happy if there are any questions at any point for any of the items in this memo. Appreciate that. Any comments or questions from members of the board? Not any. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Teal. We appreciate that. Um, as demonstrated early in the meeting, we do have a bit of a truncated schedule, so we're moving into some housekeeping at the end. We did receive an appeal. We have one appeal on the agenda today. You've received the commissioner's decision and the written appeal with supporting documents submitted by the campuses and the appellate. The issue before the board for the appeal is whether to consider that appeal at a later meeting. Our appeal policy does not require us to accept an appeal if we're satisfied with the commissioner's review and conclusion. The sole question is whether any regent believes the issues addressed in the commissioner's decision need further review by the board. If you do not wish to hear the appeal at the board level, it is not necessary to make a motion. A lack of action on our part will signify our decision to not hear the case. The appeal is confidential. The board will not address the individual involved by name, identify the campus involved, or discuss the facts or specific issues. Are there any general questions as to this procedure before we consider the appeal? Not seeing any, I would entertain a motion to hear the appeal before the board. If you wish to move the appeal, please identify the appeal by number and not by the name of the appellant. Not hearing any motion for the appeal, the appellant's request that we entertain these appeals are denied. The commissioner's decision in the appeal is upheld. Again, thank you uh, to Allie and team for your work on that as well. Quick agenda, public comment. Any public comment out there? Anything that persists to this agenda or any items otherwise in front of the board? I'm not seeing any. Everybody's online. Making this pretty easy for us today. Um, before we break into executive session, does any board member have any comments regarding today's agenda or future agendas? Garrett, you got your feet underneath you. You're feeling good? Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate your attendance. And to everybody, we certainly do appreciate your attendance. Um, we had a neat opportunity, and I think we'll all reflect on some re incredible comments made about our colleague, Regent Rogers, as she wraps up her seven-year tenure 
on this board. Thank you so much for your commitment. And we know that you're engaged at many other levels with higher ed and count on you staying engaged and really look forward to future opportunities to work with you. Thank you for that. Um, our next items will be taken up on an executive session as we move into the executive session. And as the pro providing officer, I have determined that these discussions relate to matters of individual privacy and that the demands of individual privacy clearly exceed the merits of public uh, disclosure. The meeting will adjourn upon the completion of executive session. I'm appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you for being with us.